This episode is sponsored by Auto Trader. See a car in a movie that you just watched? You can find it on Auto Trader. Shop millions of new and used cars on Auto Trader. Welcome to Ear Biscuits, the podcast where two lifelong friends talk about life for a long time. I'm Rhett. And I'm Link. This week at the round table of dim lighting. I'm gonna I, I just got to know about your Skin dive. It is called skin diving, right? Every time I say it, I'm like, hold on. Am I saying the sexual term that's confused with what you're doing? Skin diving. Well, what would that be? Well, skin diving sounds... Just a, another name for sex? Yeah. Sex without a condom. Right. So you are... Um, which, we, which we don't recommend unless you've been fixed like we have. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You, you you learned how I, I, to. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if that's a proper term. Free diving is the free is, diving. Free di- but skin diving, I think, is an. L- I don't know. Honestly, that's. Free, oh, I knew I didn't have it right. Free, free diving. diving, where you hold your breath and go to depths of up to or beyond fifty feet. Okay, I I gotta. This is tapping into fears for me. Uh, and I know that you got trained, so I, I need the download on your free diving. Um, you prepared for that? Yeah. I've got video that uh, Hal, you know, Hal of Hollywood Divers. Shout out. Um, who is a friend of the show, that show being Good Mythical Morning, because we originally got to know Hal when he was on that episode of Who's the Who's the Boss? <laughs> We played that lineup game where we had we looked at a set of people and one of them was the boss and a couple of them were employees and you had to ask them questions to figure out who was the boss. Okay. And I think we accurately guessed that Hal was the boss. So Chase got to know Hal and Chase was already into scuba diving because Chase produced that episode. Right. And that Chase made Hollywood Divers his like dive shop of choice. So when we got into diving, we went with them as well. Right, to get and, certified. And Hal is a he's, a, he's a Carolina boy, North Carolina boy, East Carolina boy. Okay. And uh, so we, we love to, we, we have a lot in common, having grown up in North Carolina. We always have a good time. So he took me and Chase and Shepard out, and anyway, he filmed uh, some of this, and I have it on a little teeny micro SD card that I'll give to Jamie to make sure that the video version of this has at least some complimentary video. I haven't seen it yet. Okay. So yeah, um, Shepard, who is now, and can I can I can I stop you there for a minute? Yeah. I can't wait for you to get into it, but I do I do want to talk about Wonderhole first. Oh, let's because proceed. Because it just came out on Friday, mm-hmm. and this comes out on Monday, so. Our future selves are experiencing the first episode of our passion project comedy series, Rhett and Link's Wonderhole, in in real time right now. We're reacting to people's reactions. Or trying not to react. Well, we're um hmm. we're basking in the glow of People enjoying episode one, or curling up in the fetal position because nobody liked it. Yeah, we're um, yeah. As we record we this, really we're, don't know. we're in an interesting anticipatory place. But just want to put a shameless plug out there: go to the Rhett and Link YouTube channel, our OG YouTube channel. If you're not subscribed, the one that started it all. That's right. The reason if, that we're right here, right now. If you are not subscribed, please subscribe. Watch the episode if you haven't. Check it out. Uh, we took the world's most expensive first class flight is what it's called. And we did that in a sense. Dot, dot, dot. We did that in a sense, Um, but we did much more. After having our red carpet show it on a movie theater screen event. Yeah, we did a premiere. I'm feeling so excited. Let me talk a little bit about why we did it like that. So, as you know, we made the decision to set aside the the you know the game that we have been sort of secretly playing for for many years of 
you know, there's the stuff that you see us make and there's all the stuff that we do. We talked about this in our We're Done video that was on the Rhett and Link channel. Um, you see all the stuff that we actually make, right? The mythical stuff, Good Mythical Morning, Ear Biscuits, Mythical Kitchen, et cetera, everything on the society. But meanwhile, a not insignificant chunk of our time has been spent for the past few years in like try developing other things for what you would call traditional media, right? TV, movies, whatever. And there's been some success. We've had a couple of TV shows most recently, a couple of years ago on Food Network. Um, but we've set that aside and just thrown ourselves into Wonderhole as our sort of first step into just making the thing that we want to make. Essentially kind of making the thing that we know if we had pitched it directly to a network or a streamer, they would have said no. We've got enough experience to know that they would have been like, nah. So we were just right. like, well, let's just make the thing we want to make. And because we are... We, and we, we actually made the decision to make our own series before. Like, it wasn't that we came up with this idea and we realized we couldn't pitch it. That, that isn't what happened. We decided that we wanted to make something without for, for ourselves. Thinking about the networks right. or streamers or whatever. Yeah. Without trying to formulate something that we thought someone would buy, we formulated a show that we were extremely excited about pouring all of our creative energy into. And I think we've, I know we've succeeded. At, at pouring all of our energy into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely did that. <laughs> right. Right. Ear Biscuits is supported by Auto Trader. We live in LA. You look around anywhere, you know what you're gonna see? Cars, mm -hmm. lots of them. And guess what? They're probably all on Auto Trader. I've had uh, many a car in my day. Yeah. You know, I've had cars that I thought were pretty cool. I've had cars that I tried to fix and ended up totaling, like my 1996 Dodge Intrepid when I got the bright idea to change the water pump. Ooh, that's a, that's That ambitious. was too ambitious. You never got that Crown Vic you wanted. I didn't. Mm. Maybe one day I will. If you see it on the road, you can likely find it on Auto Trader, right? It's not too late to get that Crown Vic. Mm -hmm. New cars, used cars, electric cars, all types of cars. With millions of options to choose from, buying a car becomes a whole lot easier. See it, find it, Auto Trader. Sometimes when it's getting later in the day, I say to myself, Rhett, you need to pick me up. But then I say, Rhett, don't drink coffee right now because you'll be up forever. I also don't ever just say Rhett and then something. I actually don't do that. In come the people from Mud Water. They sent us a sample of their product. I'd seen ads for this thing you know, like for a couple of years now. I've been wanting to try it. I will say that as Link was putting it together, he spilled he spilled it. He spilled both of ours. Uh, I may have also spilled mine a little bit when mixing, but I'm gonna say it was all his fault because he's not here to record this ad with me. Well, switching to mud water can help you say goodbye to sleepless nights. It's got all the energy without the late night existential crises. To use mud water, you simply drop the powder into your favorite mug or maybe your least favorite mug. Use whatever mug you want. Pour some water on it and give it a mix. There's also caffeine-free blends available, although the regular version has, I think, a pretty low level of caffeine compared to coffee. With organic ingredients for a clean, natural boost, mud water is smooth, earthy flavors provide a delicious and natural source of energy. Their OG blend contains cacao and chai for a hint of caffeine and hot chocolate-like flavor, lion's mane for focus, cordyceps to promote natural energy, and both chaga and reishi to support a healthy immune system. For a limited time, you can get up to 43% off your entire order, free shipping, and a free rechargeable frother when you use our exclusive link. Head to mudwater.com slash ear and grab your starter kit. That's up to 43% off your order at mudwtr.com forward slash ear. After you purchase, they ask you where you heard about them. Please support Ear Biscuits and tell them we sent you. Stay energized and refreshed all summer long with mud water because life's too short for anything less than natural, delicious energy. Um... But we decided to do a premiere. And that's a win. We we did what we set out to do, which was make this thing. Yeah. If people like it, it's icing on the cake. <laughs> but it also enables us to continue doing it and all right, that. Right, right, right. So we decided to do uh, sort of a traditional premiere. Be and also, like, 
make six episodes and release it on a weekly basis to essentially say every that Friday this is our this is the TV show that we're making, right? Really, the distinction between a TV show and something like Good Mythical Morning is really at this point, it's like, well, you go to your TV and you click on an icon. Are you going to click on the Amazon Prime icon or the Netflix icon or the YouTube TV or YouTube icon? From your point of view, it doesn't really make that big of a difference. Right. So our thought was, well, let's pr instead of doing what we did last year and just making like an episode, when an episode's ready, we release it like a typical YouTube channel or like a monthly release. Let's just see what happens if we treat this as a TV show and present it as a, like a weekly release like you would do on HBO or whatever. So there are some similarities to what we've done in previous, the, in last year. Um, and that's why we decided to do the premiere, which was. But there are some there are there are some notable differences, and it is it is much more of a show. I mean, you, you talk about it's still very much a YouTube made for YouTube, um, in some senses. Right. There's. It's true that it's a comedy series that, like, once you click on Netflix or Max or YouTube, once you're in there, I think we're giving you that same level of experience. On one hand, on the other hand, it does kind of bridge the gap. It straddles the gap, <laughs> the closing gap, which used to be a chasm between YouTube video, YouTube YouTube content, and other streaming content. Right. So it's it's in an interesting place, which makes it unique. I also think the tone is very unique. I feel like it's very much us, and you can't really compare it directly to any one thing, but to all the things that maybe we've done in the past, but yeah. also the way we've been influenced. But back to the premiere. If you don't like us, you're not going to like it. That's for sure. Yeah, but if you don't like one episode, you might like the next. So, um, The premiere was more of, you know, it was a pretty small event, like 200 people. It was mostly people who worked on the show, and then, you know, quote, industry friends, you know, YouTubers and TV personalities and, and stuff that, that, that we know, and then industry, like, press people, and also a lot of YouTube people, because YouTube was gracious enough to put this event on with us, right? They've been a really good partner in this, and I say what I mean by partner is essentially like they are supportive of the of our efforts to make this kind of content for their platform. Uh, you know, we it's all self financed for for us. They they don't have any involvement in that, and they're not like giving any advice or anything. Like it's not like a network, but they're very supportive and and and, and want this to be a success. But it's up to us, and it's up to you for it to be a success. It's not really they don't do anything to like manipulate the platform. But they did come to the come to the event, and uh, you know, were basically kind of showed up as the, hey, this is a mythical and a YouTube sort of presentation, which was which was a very cool thing. Yeah, and uh, and we got to see we don't get to see the things that we make in the context of a live audience, which is such a weird thing. We make right. the stuff that people enjoy in the privacy of their own homes, and the only way you find out what people think is funny is from comments. Or things that get memefied, or things that get broken out into a TikTok video. But when you're in a room with people, it, especially with the way that we think, and it, I mean, it the scrutiny that I couldn't help but apply to all the reactions in the room. You know, it's a totally different thing. And it's like, okay, how many laughs are we getting? Are they building? Are we missing? with any of these? Do any of these fall flat? Are there times when we're shifting the tone and people don't understand or they're, they're catching up? Or we're trying to, to accomplish something and it doesn't seem, they, they seem a little behind or they don't get it. You know, we're, we tried a lot, even within episode one, but across this whole series, I wish we could have showed the whole thing. I wish we can continue to screen the episodes in a room so that yeah. we could, you know, there's, there's so much to learn. Actually, we talked about how there might be too much to learn because that's a it's theater not is people, not. It's not people watch YouTube videos. The actual, you know, the the way it should be experienced. Um, 
but it was really rewarding to actually have the premiere because it puts into practice something that we're we're not great at even though we've written about in our book of mythicality which is stopping and celebrating and i think before this thing comes out on youtube to have this yes it's a premiere yes it's promotional but it's also a celebration like a lot of our close friends who have been like super supportive of us creatively from a personal standpoint were there to react to it and to see it. You know, I, I have friends that don't watch any of my content. For them to show up and have this enthusiastic response, it, it, it means something different. And it was, it was very special to have this moment, you know. We, we rented a big party bus. We took a lot of the mythical crew, including the core Wonderhole crew. And then when it was, when we got there, we did, we did the, we had like a, a little mixer beforehand. And we had the, the screening. And then we, they had a Q and A with us afterward. And then we had a party. And then after the party was over, we all got back on that bus and came back. And because we were all dispersed talking to people, it gave us time to celebrate together and to like debrief on the ride back and say, what did, what, what's the feedback you got kind of thing. So it kind of put a bow on the whole thing that, I, that we got to experience together. Um, yeah, to me, which it's is like, really it's special. An, to me, it's a, I always want to do it for any new project because I just feel like it's another data point. Not for, for me, you know, I obviously we're a little bit different in that my like, I'm not saying I don't think stopping and celebrating is important, and I think I should be better at it. But I savor it a little bit less, like than you do. Like for me, it's more just like I even said it when I was there to multiple people. I was like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to necessarily enjoy this process because the thing that I get the most satisfaction out of is when I feel like I did the thing that I set out to do, right? That in, in that in that I not that I didn't not just leaving it all in the field, but like this is as good as I can do. And I also realized that that's like a asymptotic, whatever the word, yeah. is some unachievable goal where you well, it's keep a moving target. You keep moving the, the least. target. But at some point you will have done the best thing you could do and you will have reached it. Right. So it's not asymptotic, but... Right, yeah, there is a reality to the fact that I will have done at some point the best that I can do. And so because I feel like Wonder Hall is such a significant step towards that, uh -huh. but it is definitely not that. <laughs> so I, can, I can't, like, I'm just thinking like, boy, this is all really great feedback. I want people to be honest with me. I want people to tell me. I don't want to be like, oh, I'm going to say these things to you because you're my friend, which is a very, like... LA thing because you go to see things that people have made all the time and you're not going to be an asshole and tell them that it wasn't good. Um, I'll speak for yourself. And so, uh, and so there are a number of like sort of catchphrases that I picked up on that people will say like, oh, that was so fun. This, it was so fun. You guys seem to really enjoy yourselves. <laughs> like there's lots of things that you can say that sound encouraging, but the underneath the subtext is, I don't have anything to say that was complimentary. That wasn't what I experienced at the Wonder Hole premiere. Oh. I was very happy. Oh, I thought you were saying that is No, 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 what I experienced was people that I trust saying that they liked it, but then insisting on continuing to talk about it, which in my experience, when I go to something that a friend has done, I th and I don't, I'm looking for the thing to say. Mm -hmm. And so then I like find the thing to say, and that's the first thing I say. But then, because I'm saying it more for their benefit and edification rather than like this, I'm going to give you like some critical feedback right now when you're celebrating this thing. I don't keep talking about it because that would seem really disingenuous, right? Oh, and so the the there's a few trusted friends who kept kept talking about it. No, nobody was like, oh. This is like some like you've you've made the perfect piece of media or anything like I'm not that right. But it was very much just like you guys. I can see what you were trying to do, and I think that you did it. And that's what I'm celebrating. 
And I also cannot help but think, now that we've done this, how much, like what we can take and grow from and, and actually apply to doing even more of it. So did you have the moment of satisfaction at some point during the screening or during filming? When you're like, I'm most satisfied when I've accomplished what I set out to do. So did that happen for uh, you? I think I've had more of that feeling just along the process of being like, wow, we're really like, we were in this room talking about this thing. We came up with this idea for this thing to happen during the episode or for this left turn to occur or for us to weave these two things together. And then we actually did it. So it's not like one singular realization. Like we screen it in our office with our smaller team. Right. And I, I, I guess... <clears throat> But again, I'm always of two minds. There's the satisfaction of being like, we did that. And then there's the like, okay, it wasn't perfect. How can it be perfect? And I can't really let go of that. And I also don't feel like I necessarily suffer because of that. It's just my disposition. So I'm kind of like, all right, this is just, I, not. I had a great time at the, at the premiere, but I'm always of two minds. I think... I relate to that. For me, the premiere was this like uh, stake in the ground that was like, okay, well, it would have been nice if it was done so I could say, this thing is done and now it's going out there, but we had to get up the next morning and shoot, and shoot two days worth of uh, production episode for, the, for episode five, which we have now completed. Because episode six was already shot. Because no now I feel like after that, I was like, there was a complete relief. Like this weekend, I was just like feeling great about it's done and we've already partied about it. Um, but yeah, I was definitely, um, on the other hand, the moment we got there on stage and we were being asked a few questions about it, we started talking about how our, our mind was going 100 miles an hour with um, notes. And all of it was not was geared towards how does this impact what we do next which in our 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 full intention is to do wonder hole season 2 next there are some challenges which which i i can elucidate but at that point i was like you know what i have notes i have i noted things that didn't work i noted things that we could have done better that started to work uh, or did work, but could be so much fill in the blank. We c this could have been so much funnier. This could have been so much more surprising. This could have been so much more moving. Um, I feel like I can learn from the positives of what, like if I'm looking at my own performance, my performance in this scene compared to this scene and how maybe it's uneven or, you know, it's mm -hmm. like I think about all these things and like, ways to improve and invest in moving forward. But at the same time, I was really trying to appreciate what it was and being in that room and kind of watching it with other people brought me as close as I could be at times to forgetting that it was us and something we made. You know, because we don't watch our stuff on a movie screen, so it's like, I'm watching, I can, I can trick myself into thinking I was watching somebody else's thing. And in those moments, I was very happy. You know, I was very proud of whoever made this thing and I was all in on it. I could feel that the production value was like really good. So no detriment to that to say at the same time, I could feel that it was made by a team that you could count, you could you could see in a small room and you could count, you know. So um, when we were out in the field, you could pretty much count everybody working on it on two hands, even if you'd lost a couple of fingers. Right. You know? The crew was never very big. Right. And I think that that gives a feeling to it that it wasn't that it was scrappy, but that it was or homemade, it's something else that I don't have a word for, but it's, 
it's kind of in between like this like a full budget to do the type of thing we have an ambition to do and a a low budget. We're like somewhere in the middle that actually gave it charm and heart. Yeah. So I actually felt really good about that. Um, even though what I want people to say, man, this could be, this could be, I, this could have been on HBO Max or, you know, because I think their stuff is more elevated, right? I don't know if that's the case. And I'm okay with that at this point. Yeah, it is. You know, what it so is. I started to feel like what it was is um, something that, we were extremely creative. We took some big creative swings. And even when you were confused instead of surprised, because there's lots of like um, moments of surprise that we try to bake in. Even if, even if that is not exactly right, I think it's, it feels good to see someone really go for it. And we as a team, I feel like really went for it. And that was very satisfying to me. And we, it worked to the point that the criticisms I have are, um, they're the minority of things that I experienced. Yeah. You know? And I actually think all that stuff you said at the beginning about like, you know, the notes and the, this could have been this, you know, you know, I have all the same observations about my performance and, and, and all that. To me, that's also something to celebrate because when you do what we've been doing for the past 10 years on that front, which is writing a pilot script, spending a bunch of time on it, doing revisions, uh, having conversations right. with, with network executives about it, when you never get to the making of you, it. You didn't get to make it, so right. you never actually got to apply any of the lessons. Exactly. So when you just, okay, so, it, you know, I can't help but think, like, damn it, we should have started this earlier, but it's okay, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. I wish I was 36, not 46. Like, all, I, I, have, the, I have those <laughs> thoughts, right? But um, having made it and having achieved what we wanted to achieve and just knowing that, like, actually dialing in a few different elements of it is actually the easier part than just making the thing and having it work in general. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very encouraged. Part of the excitement in the way that we constructed each episode was that we baked in numerous creative questions. What is it gonna feel like if we do this and then this? What is it gonna feel like for an for an audience to experience this thing with going in blind because we're not blind we know what we've planned so i'm really excited to start to see the answers to those questions see if we can decipher the answers to the creative questions that we've had because there's a lot of genre bending a lot of genre skipping and it's it kind of mesh uh like meshes isn't the right word but it it kind of moves into this continuum of genre experiment as one example of like a line of questions that make me excited for it to come out and because we won't be in the room watching and and I won't be able to interrogate my trusted creative uh friends you know like I did at the party I interrogated people. Would you, you know, I wasn't afraid to keep talking about my own show. Oh, really? Yeah. At, w at one point, two of my two, a friend and an acquaintance started talking about another show that they were watching, and I was, you know, I was still there. So I said, "Hey, this this is a this is my this this is about my show tonight. I want I want you to talk about my show." And I was joking, but <laughs> but not you, really. But not really. They laughed. Um, so there's a lot of questions well, that I'm trying to answer, and I don't think they'll all be answered. Well, but. and then the, bi the, the big question, which is this is like, uh, I was talking to a friend yesterday actually about this. I was like, it's equally exciting and frustrating to know that the big question that we will have at least some piece of an answer for by the time this comes out is like, 
how does how well does it work on YouTube? And the, mm-hmm. the equally exciting and frustrating thing is that how good it is 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 a is a small piece <laughs> is a small piece of how well it will work on YouTube, right? Yeah, because if you think about it, just look at videos that have tens of millions of views. Just just pick one at random. Yeah. And you'll, you'll look at the you'll most understand. look at the most viewed videos on YouTube, and then try to track views to quality. And I, at least by my standards, I don't think you will see a correlation. However, I mean, like, okay, for example, the 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 video that has gotten the most views in many many years on the Red Link channel is just the one where we just kind of set up the whole idea for us making this series, and the only reason it has over 4 million views is because it's called We're Done, and people thought that we were quitting YouTube. <laughs> and it's like, that's the world that we live in, right? It's, that's the world that we live in. So is we that, have to learn to manipulate that world, which is why we made that video in that way. Yeah. So the and question it's also is- the way that, it's also the reason why we're making these episodes, we're- Every episode of the Wonder Hall is The title and thumbnails are as they are. Yeah, structured around a, uh, our best guess at a title and a thumbnail that will actually work on the platform. Because we want it to break out we'll, we'll of see if that ha- works. the dedicated fan base of Mythical Beasts that you are a part of, which, you know, l- leads me to ask, will you share it with somebody who is not a habitual GMM viewer, you know, somebody who knows about us, but does, you know, they may not be a mythical beast, you know, preferably they're not at all. So it's like, share it, share it with, uh, share it with some of those people. I think that will, that's what we're hoping to do is, is to reach out and bring more people into the fold because this is, this is a different thing than Good Mythical Morning. Now I mentioned some of the challenges that we have, um, you know, briefly, in terms of like our ambition to create a season two is very high. I mean, like our plans are to do that. Am I making an announcement that we're going to do it? I feel like I can, but I but also I can't because, um, well, the business side of it, right? Like we're committed to um, continuing to bet on ourselves and invest in ourselves but it has been an investment so far. D- and unless this thing gets a an astronomical amount of views, it will not pay for itself in season one. So- And that's not really the- That wasn't, we knew that. really the- We knew that. Yeah. But, but to make it sustainable, to, d- to do a, you know, our hopes for a season two are we need um, sponsors. We need some sort of, ad integration beyond just the AdSense ads that pop up around before and after and like mid rolls. Like inking some deals with brands that can underwrite an increased budget for season two um, so that we can invest in the things that uh, to accomplish the notes that we have, right? To continue to- Or just to pay the budget that we have (laughs) for season one. Yeah, that's true. I think that's the, so that's, from a business standpoint, that's a big challenge, and it seems like it's it's one that I mean it's one that we're certainly up for, and it and we get frustrated because it seems like that should be easier to do, but I think because it's a new property, it's hard to do. The success of it, I think, will impact our ability to sell against it for a second season. So yeah, we're watching sure. watching closely the level of engagement, and you know. Uh, how well it performs on YouTube. So anyway, thank you for listening to us, you know, talk about it like we would if we were just sitting in our office talking about it, you know, right. de- debriefing. This is like, this is the, where the practical side of the creative process um, kind of comes into play. And I will say that um, we are, we do not, discount the fact or we are not unaware of the fact that we have this incredible privilege to make the thing that we want to make and you know the same friend i was talking to yesterday about the show you know it's been working on this 
screenplay for three years and is basically sending it out this week. And he's like, I know it's good. I know that I've done everything I can. And, you know, I had read the first draft on this thing, which like two and a half years ago and given some notes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he's and he's like, but it, the thing I prepare myself for emotionally is knowing that whether or not it's good is not really the reason that it will get made or not get made because that's not how people make decisions in this town. They make decisions based on will it sell. Right. And what sells is not necessarily what is good. Now, sometimes it all aligns and it is. But it it, I, it wasn't lost on me that like, we spent all this time investing into this thing and working on it and we got to make it. And some people got to see it and some people will like it. Whether or not it's like, oh, it's a, it's a commercial success is like, that would be this wonderful story that we could tell and it would be awesome, but and not we're only already the, yeah. we're already in a really incredible spot that we should be grateful for. Yeah. And we did it this way and we are encountering the challenges, you know, in terms of like budgeting strategically because our other like big projects uh, throughout the years that did get made, we were asking Mythical Beasts to then go to another platform or to subscribe to another thing, to pay money mm -hmm. for it. Like, this is completely free. It is completely visible by anyone in the world. In the world it's that, not just for people in the United States. has access yeah. to YouTube. So it was, you know, we have the money to invest at this point, right? So, you know, it's like, let's, let's, give as many people a chance to see this with as few barriers as possible. So, um, and we were, having the ability to do that is was the realization we had and we followed through with it. And yeah, it's not lost on me that like, it is a tremendous privilege to be in this place. A lot of creators don't have the money to invest in the way that we have or the audience we have. Um, so even within the realm of like, creators, YouTube, et cetera, um, we're trying to prove what, you know, we're trying to champion the cause of creativity for them, but also connect some of the dots from a business standpoint so that they can follow in our footsteps and that the quality of content that we're seeing from creators is able to, um, increase maybe not just the quality but like people being able to like really put themselves out there and not feel like the so only, waving that flag the only way to make it work is it for it to get caught in the algorithm in a certain way it's like we'll yeah. see okay but the way to do that the way for that to happen is for you know if you like it if well first of all watch it if you like it talk about it share it in the way that you would a tv show that you like the next five Fridays at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific, it comes out on the Retin Link YouTube channel. Okay, thanks for indulging our uh, infomercial for Wonderhole. I, we didn't even know we were going to talk about it until we sat down. Then we realized, oh, this is right after premiere. Yeah, we got it. Right. We th this is the perfect time to talk to you about it. So, hope you're half as excited as we are. D uh. I was gonna make a pun about, but I'm not gonna hold my breath, but then I, I wouldn't have meant that. But I was trying to transition to you holding your breath. Ear Biscuits is brought to you by BetterHelp. One of our mottos here at Mythical is stay curious. It's important for us to ask questions and then see what happens. It's an ethos that has been very rewarding in terms of not only creating content, but keeping our lives fresh. We're like grown up kids in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And kids are always learning and growing, but as adults, sometimes we lose that curiosity. What's something you'd like to learn? Gardening, a new language, or maybe how to finally beat your best friend in bowling? <laughs> Therapy can help you reconnect with your sense of wonder because your back to school era can come at any age. I feel that. I actually talk about the development of our show Wonder Hole a lot and how Personally, I've wanted to make it a playground for creativity 
within therapy. We are a huge advocate for therapy. So if you're thinking of starting, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Rediscover your curiosity with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash ear today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash ear. Ear Biscuits is supported by Rosetta Stone. I've done some traveling this year and every yep. time I travel I am reminded at how many languages I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> most of them in fact. Yeah, yeah. In comes Rosetta Stone, the most trusted language learning program available on desktop or as an app that truly immerses you in the language you want to learn. They've used trusted experts for 30 years with millions of users and 25 languages offered, including but not limited to Spanish, French, Italian, German, Korean, Chinese, Japanese, and Arabic. Rosetta Stone immerses you in many ways and is designed for long-term retention. For example, it has no English translation, so you really learn to speak, listen, and think in that language. And their built-in true accent feature gives you feedback on your pronunciation, so it's like having a personal trainer for your accent. Plus, it's an amazing value. A lifetime membership has all 25 languages for any trips and or language needs in your life. That's lifetime access to all 25 language courses Rosetta Stone offers for 50% off. That's a steal. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a very limited time, you can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off. Visit rosettastone.com slash ear. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com slash ear today. So yes, Shepard had been asking about this because he is now, um, he's actually, like you, advanced scuba certified. He's not, Yeah. you're also nitrox certified. You of didn't course. get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he's been asking about free diving. He, and I li have always liked the idea of free diving because before I ever scuba dove, is that how you would say it, scuba dove? Sure. I don't think it is, but. Scuba dived. Scuba dived? Yeah. Um, before I ever did that, I've always liked being in the water and being under the water, like since I was a kid, you know, and. You were a competitive swimmer. I was a competitive swimmer. You were a member of the Keith Hills pool. Yes, I was. But I also was like, you know, it was the thing to do to like see how far you could swim underwater and like how many lengths of the pool can you swim without coming up for air and stuff like that. And so. I always did that. So I was like, I think that I think that I will be good at this. And also the I love scuba diving. The only thing I don't like about scuba diving is all of the equipment. And like how heavy the thing is and the the you know, people don't realize like when you watch like a scuba diver in a movie like walking around, mm -hmm. you know like that tank is very heavy. Especially the the steel tanks in California, like it's it's just very cumbersome, right? Yeah, and being able to be like, I've got on a wetsuit and I've got some fins and a mask, and I could just go into the water. So Hal took Chase Shepard and I, because Chase was also interested in getting his free dive certification, uh, to Catalina Island which is the same place that right there in their little uh, marine park or whatever it's called. Yeah, where I got scuba certified. Where I got certified as well. That's where now, we did this. I will see videos on social media of people swimming down to like unbelievable depths. That is with, not with, what we did. With nothing except maybe a spear and some goggles. And they're just, you know, there's some people who would be like, wh like world record holding free dives, people just holding their breath forever, going down forever. And they're just like, they're just effortlessly dancing in the water. And it is so anxiety inducing for me. You see like, um, I don't know where, it, in different parts of the world, you've got people Blue holes. like, huh? Blue holes. No, I'm talking about the free divers jumping off boats and then like 
it, they're like tri there's like a tribal vibe to these people who are diving down and fishing for their livelihood. Oh, but they're like right, uh-huh. really advanced like pearl divers. In yeah, the, in, pearl divers in, in the South Pacific and stuff. Free, like just just going for it, just going deep, holding their breath forever, effortlessly, and it. I think it is one of the. It might be one of my biggest fears. It makes me so anxious. I never grew up going to the Keith Hills pool. Like the times when I would be invited to the pool party and everybody would play shark or whatever that is, where there's cross like, the pool. Cross the pool and you're diving everybody's on one side and they're diving in and trying to get not get tagged. Like I I I was so scared I thought I was gonna shit my pants, you know? I just You were just scared of having your face underwater. Well, I mean I could do it. I could swim, I could put my head under water, but I wasn't great at it. Like I wasn't a great swimmer. I never, I, I, I just knew how to swim, but that was it. That was like the baseline. You know, my mom uh, pretty much can't swim. It's like she had an accident. Like, well, it's not. Dove it's in not and hit genetic. her head. It's not genetic. But I think that she, she certainly didn't encourage it because she's been afraid of swimming. Right. Like we were, we did go to another pool, but like, she would never get in the water. She would like wade in a little bit and then get back out. So I like never saw her swim because in high school she hit her head on the bottom of the pool and then she got too scared to do it again. Anyway, even now, like if I'm swimming in my own pool and because I've gotten into scuba diving, I've, and when I was trying to get ready for my first scuba training, I, w I would swim under the water and just hold my breath and try to swim the length of the pool, not knowing that that's not really a component of scuba diving. You're always breathing. You actually never hold your breath. It's bad to hold your breath when scuba diving. Don't right. do it. Um, I will just experience, in the first few seconds of being underwater, like if I have to dive down and get something from the bottom of the pool, I'll start to experience a little panic. So then, like, even if I'm going down to the bottom of the pool, grabbing one thing, by the time I grab that thing, I'm like, if I don't get it on the first try, I gotta come up. And even when I get it, I'm like, oh my God, I got, I, I, I'm like, I'm coming up so fast. And then when I, no matter how long I've been underwater, when I come up, I'm like, <gasps> <laughs> it's just, a, it, it just makes me it's so all, anxious, but it's, man. But it, it is all mental. It's not a, it, I don't think. So you are set up for it. You're totally comfortable with it. And I do understand that but it's here's totally the thing. mental. Here's the thing, I haven't, you know, we did a breath holding thing on the show years ago, just static in those, in those horse troughs that we have. And I think I did over three minutes. And um, I would not be able to do that now. I haven't. So what did they train you? No what? training, no, like there was no preparation. This might blow your mind. It blew my mind because I just didn't believe it was gonna happen. None of us had done any respiratory training at all before Saturday. And all three of us, he told us that we were gonna be able to do this. And I just really was like, I don't feel, I, like I was a little bit, I wasn't comfortable and I'll tell you reasons why. But not even by the end of the class, by the middle of the class, Shepard, Chase and I all dove down to the Jacques Cousteau plaque in the Marine Park and touched it and came back up. Well, that's it's about 45 40, feet. 43 feet down. Damn. I mean. And it was actually Because my pool not, is eight feet deep. It was not hard. And that's when I, exper I experienced the panic. It, it wasn't hard. How long? Well, how long? I, well, let me explain. Does it take to get down to 43 feet and back up? When you've got these fins on, not long at all. The, 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 the most... The nerve wracking part of it is the fact that you have to be equalizing constantly, mm -hmm. and the deeper you get, the more difficult it gets to equalize. Uh -huh, yeah. Once you pass 30 feet. But that's no different than scuba. Right, but in scuba, you are, when you go down, typically you are right side up, and you're just letting the weight, you're, you're, you're getting the air out of your BC and floating down very slowly, and you're just going, and you're kind of just getting down to your depth, and then you start swimming around. Yeah. With this, 
you got to get down there because you've got one breath. So you pike dive at the surface. So you jump out of the water like a dolphin? No, you know, pike diving. So my head is like this, and then I, then you throw your body down and put your feet up. So you go down, and you immediately, like, okay. when I turn over, I'm already six and a half feet deep. My head is six and a half <laughs> feet deep. Are you allergic to this conversation? <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt my body's trying to expel. And at six feet, something. you're already in need of some yes. equalization. As you know, if we're going to the bottom of your pool, you probably feel the pressure on your ears. Yeah, yeah. And I have one good ear. Like right ear is like, yes, I'm here. I'm ready to go. And left ear is like, you got to really push me to equalize. There's huh. just something genetic in my eustachian tubes that creates that problem. But so you're going down and you're like, hold, I'm, I can't do the, is it Frenzel technique, which is you use your th tongue as a throat piston. And like <laughs> those guys, it, like if you watch okay. like these Netflix documentaries. Sounds like that could have other applications. If you, you, if you watch these Netflix documentaries and these dudes are going, the world record is over 700 feet on one breath. Damn, what? S think about that. And now, no, 700 feet. And if you didn't know, people don't scuba dive at 700 feet. Nobody does that. I mean, I'm sure there's probably somebody who has, but the reason you don't do that is because of the decompression issues with like breathing compressed air and being, but you don't have to worry about decompression with, with this because it's the same air the whole time. There's no opportunity for nitrogen yeah, to like the, get into your okay. blood. But your body experiences pressure, including all your of lungs. The, all of the pressure, yeah, 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 all of the same pressure. Which is why you're equalizing your ears, but do you have to equalize your lungs? Do you have to? Uh... No, in, in fact, you do not want to let any air out. The only air you're using is the air to equalize, but at no point, at no point do you want to exhale any air because as you come back up, you want the air in your lungs to create buoyancy to continue to send you up. Yeah. Because you're wearing a weighted belt. Shit. That creates a uh, a neutral buoyancy at 20 feet down. So in other words, if I'm 20 feet or above, I am positive, I am positively buoyant, so I'm coming, uh, it, the natural tendency is to you come up. back up, mm -hmm. and 20 feet and below, it's to send you, the weight sends you down. Because of the uh, pressure of the water above you. With the compression of your wetsuit, it compresses your wetsuit and makes it less buoyant because you're, 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 there's volume in your yeah, wetsuit. Smushing they, air out of it. Yeah. Um, so anyway. Okay, okay. So once you got, once you swam past 20 feet, but I don't you know if I, gain I don't, we dialed in my weight. I, I felt I was a little too heavy. So he took one of the weights point, off. But at a certain point, you're going, diving down, you're gaining. But I didn't have kind of time to, I would say that out of the three of us, I was the worst at it. Shepard was the first one to touch it. And Shepard was nervous going in because like, he doesn't think he can hold his breath that long. And, but he really just like took to it. And Chase what, did it no problem. Like both Chase and Shepard like spent some time at the plaque. Cause I could like see him. On the first time? Yeah. That's bold right there. Cause you still gotta come up. And you're, I touched you're it. only halfway. I touched it and was like Brrr. How, I was like how do you booking know, it to get back to the how top. How do you know the feeling the first time you go down there that you have, that you still have half, you have what it takes to get back up? Well, the thing is, is that with those fins, you know, the free diving fins is what me and Chase had. Shepard had the just like sort of hybrid fin, so he wasn't as fast as us. You probably get to the plaque in 15 seconds. Huh. And then you probably get up in ten. So that's twenty. That's a twenty-five second dive. You can hold your breath for twenty-five seconds. Yeah. Now you are equalizing and moving your legs, and so you're expending energy, and so you're using the oxygen. So you, you can't. It's not like a static breath hold. But it hit me. I was like, oh, I understand. I totally see how somebody who was really comfortable and really well trained and had the technique down perfectly could go really, really deep. Because yeah. me, just a hack who was uncomfortable, which I'll get to in a second, was able to go to like 43 feet on the first day. 
You know what I'm saying? Like you can totally see how, like even how how is obviously like much more trained than we are because he's the instructor. He would do things where like so we had to practice rescuing people off the bottom. So not not at forty three feet. We went to like fifteen feet, and he would he would go to the bottom and like lay on the bottom like he was incapacitated, and you had to go down and you had to like bring him to the surface and put him in do si do and like keep his airway open and stuff. You have to like learn how to rescue. That was the kind of the point of the class is like rescuing each other. So like Shep would rescue me, I'd rescue Shep and do si do. You so you're talking about hugging same, somebody same from the back. Same thing as you know about in um, scuba training. You get them to the surface, you fill their BC, you. Do do si do like this? Oh oh oh, like a square dance. Yeah, and then you then you swim beside <clears> him <throat> and keep their airway open. Be, and the thing about this is that he kept. I mean, obviously this was kind of the point was to scare us a little bit, but the shallow water blackout is a real risk with free diving. If you watch these documentaries, what of the is people that? who go super super deep, it's basically passing out before you get to the top. But and why it, do they call it shallow water? As you're coming back up, because. I can't remember, even though I did take this written part of the class, I'm gonna guess 90% of shallow water blackout happens at like 20 feet or less. And it has to do with what's happening with your body as you're getting closer to the surface and the pressure's being relieved. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not dangerous, it's just less dangerous than being 45 feet down and having a blackout. At uh -huh. that point, you got your buddy's gotta come down and get you and swim up with you, take your weight belt off so he can get you to the top. Uh -huh. And um, but you know how like if you breathe, if you hyperventilate and then hold your breath, you feel like you're gonna pass out? Well, yeah. if that happens to you when you're in the water, you just pass out. In these documentaries, these people, every single person who comes up from a, from a record setting depth, they get to the top and in order to, for it to count, they have to be on their, in their own reconnaissance uh -huh. when they get to the top. And every single one of them starts to get this look on their face like, you can tell they're fighting passing out because they're pushed themselves to the absolute limit for setting these records. And I, I first of all, just why did you even watch this before you went? Uh, well, because I ne I don't, I do not ever want to do competitive free diving. Like, I'm not interested right. in going deep. I'm interested in, but it didn't. So going it didn't, down there and looking at things and going, it didn't relate. Going lobster hunting. It was a different thing. In that your kind mind. of thing. You know, you can do all that stuff at like 20, 25 feet. The stuff that I want to do, like. I'm gonna spearfish and stuff like that eventually. But I don't want to be like, I'm going 100 feet down. Yeah. But he, he put the fear of God in us about the shallow water blackout because apparently it can happen pretty easily. So there's a number of things you should do. Like you don't hyperventilate. Like if you wanna hold your breath yeah, forever. So okay, uh-huh. You I thought try to over oxygenate your blood through hyperventilation. And if you're doing a static breath hold, well, that's what you do. If you really want to go David Blaine on somebody and go super long, you breathe pure oxygen for a couple of minutes before you hold your breath. And that's how he's able to like get into a tank and just sit there like he did at the YouTube summit 10 years ago. And we were just like sitting there watching him. He's in a tank for 15 minutes because he's breathing pure oxygen. Beforehand, yeah. Yeah, now he's also a maniac who can hold his breath forever. So you combine those two things. Okay, so tell me, life. Well, you, so you're not hyperventilating at the surface. You're what are you doing? You're taking big belly breaths, almost like meditation breaths. You know, you're going deep belly breaths, not chest breaths. You're really sticking your belly out, and then you're filling your lungs, like really expanding your lungs, and then you're blowing it out. And so, what you do is you have a snorkel in. This is where I got uncomfortable. I don't like breathing through a snorkel. Okay. I've never been comfortable. I don't feel like I'm getting good air or something, you know? <laughs> because anytime I've ever like been in the ocean or a pool and I've decided to go deep, I just, I come up and I try water and I just start breathing or I hold them to the side. Yeah. But with this, what you wanna do is you wanna relax your body so that mm -hmm. you're not using your arms and legs and you are positively buoyant at the top. And you kind of go face down in the water and you breathe through your snorkel as you relax. And you're also using your vision to spot where you're gonna go. So I'm like sitting there floating like a dead man on top mm -hmm. of the water, looking at the plaque, like that's where I'm going to go. Okay. You take a few breaths. God. And then you take and one. And my heart rate is just increasing. And then you right take now. one last one. And then you spit your snorkel out. Because apparently if you keep your snorkel in and then you black out like water rushes into your lungs or something. Oh. 
more li- more readily. So you spit your stork- snorkel out, and then you 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 immediately and it's stuck hold to your the nose si- if you're me. It's stuck to the side of your. Um, it's attached to your. It's actually on the back. Mask. It's kind of on the back of your mask. Okay. To create like that. Is it the same type? Same, same kind of scuba snorkel. mask is what I have. So technically, it should be a free diving mask because it's less volume. Inside. More aerodynamic. No, it's. I didn't realize this, but like. Do you know that when you're equalizing your your ears, in the process, you're like equalizing inside of your mask as well? I guess because it's all connected through oh, the tubes. So and the stuff? air in your mask is. So if free diving masks typically have smaller volume, they look more like goggles like this, and they're smaller, so it's less. Oh, they're not over your nose. Oh, they're over your nose. Oh, okay. But they're, you know, my mask, my scuba mask is like this. Yeah. But he was like, it doesn't matter. It's your first class. Just wear your scuba mask. So Shep, he brought us a, a free diving mask for Shep, and he used that. I used my regular scuba mask, and it wasn't a problem. If I, if I really got into this, and I was like, I got to go down for a long time, and, you know. So how much of this practice did you do on the boat or on the, like, on the surface nothing. before? <laughs> In fact, as we were on the ferry out there, I was like, hey, Hal, let me just be honest with you. We, t- we took the class, but we did it real fast because <laughs> Shepard is getting ready to start school, and like we just sat down and we went through the whole thing. <laughs> so I kind of need some review. Like I need to know what's the most important stuff for me to know, especially like breathing techniques and stuff because there's like types of techniques when you do when you like come up and there's like clearing. And, and, he, and he basically was like, the main thing is you just need to like understand like belly breathing. You know, and like when you come up, what you want to do is you want to breathe all of your air out. Bring your belly button as close to your spine as possible because you're trying Mm -hmm. to get all the carbon dioxide out. You're you're wringing your lungs out. And that basically prevents, because another thing that happens is in the first 30 seconds after you come back up, that's when you have another chance of blacking out. So you have to watch your buddy. When your buddy comes up, you hyperventilate, you watch him. You're taking shallow breathing and you're not getting enough oxygen. Is yeah, that yeah, what, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. So if you're like, <gasps> it's you're not really get your lungs aren't filling up with air. It's just the top of your lungs is how I picture it. So you're not really getting That's probably oxygen. right. So if you expel, you come up to the top and you have to, it's discipline to expel all of the air before you go. Because <gasps> when you get up there, that's what you want to do. Right. But the thing he told us, and this is where it comes back to the mental thing. I was uncomfortable because. I <clears throat> could not fully relax. It was also the waves were kind of, the, there was a bit of a swell coming in. So it was like, Chop. I was getting seasick because I get seasick in the water. Oh, shit. And I didn't take Dramamine because I was like, oh, well, the ferry doesn't make me sick. But like the the bobbing up and down and like looking at all the kelp like going like this and <laughs> I get sick. So I started getting a little seasick. And so I'm a little bit seasick and like, the, there's, the waves are kind of coming in. My snorkel's getting filled up sometimes, when, and I'm having to, like, move my arms and legs a little bit. So I wasn't in, like, prime just, like, sitting there just trying to hold my breath as long as I could. So I would go down, and I would be like, man, I don't have a lot of air right now. Like, I don't feel – I got to come back up. Chase was going down and would spend – because I would, like, shadow Chase. So basically what happens is, you obviously, you never do this alone. Mm-hmm. Number one rule of freediving, you never do it alone, even though there's people who do, but you shouldn't. So, you know, we do our, it's all the same signals. He's like, I'm going to go down. I'm going to go on down. Okay. And I'm like, okay. Then he goes down, and wherever he goes, I'm swimming at the surface looking down, making sure that he's, everything's cool. And if all of a sudden he stops moving, Let's out a bubble of air or something like that. Then I would know. Oh, he's having a problem. Oh, I would so go you, down and rescue as him. his buddy, you don't dive down with him. You stay at the surface. Stay at the surface to watch him. Yeah. Oh, I guess that if somebody sense. goes really deep, you might dive down to. I don't know. I haven't gotten this far yet. They're still newbies. Okay, that that makes sense though. Okay, and that and that's why. But Chase was really good at it. That's why you had to learn how to rescue because that's your job as a buddy. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah yeah. Okay. Uh, but I never got fully comfortable. But here's the one thing Hal said. So, well, Chase is also rescue diver certified. So, he's like, got a lot of experience, and it's the ment- the mentality. You have like, to get comfortable. That that's the thing that I really enjoyed about scuba. That I think I talked about at the time was overcoming some of the fear of like 
going underwater and breathing, I had to overcome some of the anxiety I described today. And I, I like, I do like the idea and I, the experience reward of overcoming something or pushing your body and saying, no, I, I'm in charge, like volitionally. Yeah, my body is not in charge. Just, and just, and panic is not in charge. Yeah. Um, it does not help. So you didn't, so you were able to get calm pretty quick or in the first one, there's a little more, there's gotta be adrenaline and. I would go down and I was just kind of que like questioning things about like, how are my ears doing? And, <laughs> and my, like, it's funny because my right ear just goes and my left ear goes, it makes this really high pitched noise as it's equalizing. And you gotta keep equalizing as you keep going deeper. And yeah. It's just not comfortable. It never got comfortable? Uh, the left ear? I think it's always gonna be, require some level of like pushing. But again, I'm not, for just what I'm gonna- it out with a Q-tip. What, what I'm gonna try to do is like, okay, Shepard, let's go, you know, let's go get some lobsters. Because in a certain, I think it starts in either September or October, you can just go out there and if the lobsters are a certain size, mm -hmm. you know, you have to bring your little measuring thing and they have to be a certain size. You can just grab them, put them in a net, and then take them home and cook them. Grab them before they grab you. You can't spear them. It's illegal to like spear them with anything. You have to just grab them. But they will grab you. They don't have pinchers, pinchers in California. Oh, they don't. So they're defenseless. Yeah. They're scary as hell to look at though. They're big bugs. Oh God. But they, they taste, taste wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> can um, you bring me a crab leg? I can get scallops. I, I like scallops. I can get fish too, man. I like fish, but crab legs? You, there are crabs that you can bring so up in California. Can I go, the thing that has bummed me out is that like if you're getting too into this, well this is, I'm either gonna have to scuba dive separate I'm still gonna scuba dive. Well, but when you're doing this, is there opportunity to scuba dive or there's no, at the same place? Of course. Place? Like well, if yeah. you take a boat I was, out. I was free diving all around scuba divers in a Casino Point, which is so easy at Casino Point. You just walk down the steps, man. Yeah. I mean, if you weren't, if you weren't taking a class, I would have gone and just scuba dove, but I would have had a, a buddy. Yeah. Or maybe you would have done both. Oh, but here's Do you the, know how to do uh, how to, how one impacts the other? Like if you're going to free dive some if you're going to scuba dive some and then free dive, I think it might impact your that's going to impact you. From but a if you decompression standpoint? Yeah. I'm sure. But if you free dive first and then scuba dive, I don't know that that will impact you. But don't take my word for it. Yeah, I don't really know. I don't, I don't, I can't tell you that. Did you have a computer or a watch on that told you anything? My computer is, is scuba only. So Chase and, and oh, Hal yeah, mine, had, had the free diving one. Yours my, would be Dubai. Mine has an, has an app. Mine is app. like a big, like I gotta get a different dive watch. I'm, I'm not gonna get, that one you got is just too, I don't, it's just too, it's too much. I don't need all too that. Too big. It's too big and it's too expensive. I don't want because I'm not unless that's I'm gonna, never stopped you before. If I'm going to wear it all the time, I've never. Heard, I'm oh, not going to wear it all the time. I, I just want I something to like when I go diving, and I really don't yeah. want an Apple. An Apple Watch Ultra is a great dive watch. Not a great. It is a good dive watch and it like logs everything for you and you can do free diving and scuba with it. But then you've got an Apple Watch and I kind of like I don't want to do that again. <laughs> okay, all right. So I got to figure that out. But this is the thing from a mental standpoint. So you know how when we did that episode where we held our pee forever? Yeah. And I was good at that. We um we were told that this sensation to pee comes at a 25% fullness of your bladder. Yeah. Like your bladder is not made to be like when you feel like you got to piss like a racehorse. Mhm. Mm and you're like my bladder's going to burst. Well, Probably not, right? It's like to get to 100% capacity would be ridiculous. Like it, now it does happen. People do burst their bladders. It has happened. I think a president died like that or something. But, but the feeling is at 20, 25%. Yeah. So and you're so, saying, when's the feeling for breath hold? Well, that he didn't put it into those terms. But what he told me is that, you know, you're designed to breathe. Like you're supposed to 
breathe. Like your body wants to keep you breathing because that keeps you alive. So anything that's restricting breathing is going to set in some panic pre really early, like really early. Like a slight, like that's why the snorkel gets me panicking a little bit because I don't feel like I'm getting great yeah, air, yeah. you know? Um, but it's all mental. It's all mental because you are getting what you need. But then what happens is, is he says that, and this actually didn't happen to me. I didn't push it. I'm going to push it. I'm going to try it in the pool. I'm going to like try to push it to this point. But the first thing that happens is your diaphragm starts um, contracting. Spa oh. You have a spasm of the diaphragm when you're holding your breath. That, he, and he's basically like, you got to, you've got to get to a place where that happens and then you keep holding your breath and you get past the spasms. <laughs> so it's like- That sounds crazy. Running long distance and you get a cramp and you're like, you can stop or you can run through it and then you get through the cramps. So it's that kind of thing. So I think that with, I need to do some like, there's all kinds of exercises you can do to like, you can pack your lungs where you fill up as much as you can and then you start swallowing air. It's not, it's not just swallowing air because that just goes to your stomach. It's some, I, don't, I haven't done it yet, but you're stretching your lungs. Now you would never want to do that while you're actually free diving because that could be that's dangerous. That's a preparatory exercise. That is to get your lungs to actually be bigger. Okay. What, what about a technique where you're holding your breath, you're free diving, and you, you breathe, you expel the air into your mouth, and then you breathe it again to, to trick your body into thinking that you're breathing? Well, that won't work, Link. I've tried that before. Because that would have a lot of carbon dioxide in it, and your lungs would recognize that. I know, but they're still just like, oh, but there's, I am, I'm doing the action of breathing. My diaphragm is moving. Yeah, and if That's you, not anything they told you to do? And if you were to breathe carbon dioxide, like if you get inside of a coffin, buried alive, and you start breathing, you can breathe all you want, eventually you'll die. Because yeah, so you'll there's use all the oxygen. I know that, but there's no advantage to it. No, it. I mean, it, it's not going to hurt. You're either holding your breath or breathing your recycled carbon dioxide, and maybe there's still a little oxygen that you're getting out no, of it. You want to breathe it all in. Did you ask him about fake breathing inside of my mouth? Yeah, no, it, it didn't occur to me until right well, now. Well, you need to ask. And the it's big still not questions. occurring to me. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, this might be the ticket. I, I will say, on the way. I guess he knew that we were the kind of people who wouldn't matter. On the way to dive on the on the ferry, he, Hal started telling us about a book that he's reading. That I actually I started reading it as well because it intrigued me. But it's about basically the people who figured out everything that we know about decompression, uh, <clears throat> and uh, it's called Chamber Divers. I can't remember the author. I think she lives in North Carolina now. But it's basically. Nightmare stories of learning how to scuba dive. I, it, all, it all starts with an explanation of like the one of the first attacks that was made during World War II, I guess, where the Allied forces were trying to attack Germany, and they were go this is like pre D Day, and they were like trying to go up on these beaches, but they got completely wiped out by the Germans, like mowed down like 97% casualty, I think. And then they were like, well, we're gonna have to figure out a way to approach the beach underwater. And so then that, it's one of those things where like the technology for warfare ends up driving all this innovation sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so they were like, how do we get people to be in submarines? And then there, there were these, the whole book so far has just been about this family that became the experts in like what happens to people under pressure. And fascinating story of like the way they built the Brooklyn Bridge and what they would do, this was in the 1800s, first of all, crazy. There would be this giant metal reinforced room, essentially, this giant box. Okay. And they would sink it to the bottom of the river the East River, I guess, into the mud. And then they would send men down on, into this 
stairwell, and then they would go inside of the thing. Mm-hmm. Well, they would pump a bunch of air into it to send all the water out. And so the bottom of the thing would just be mud, the, the river butt bed. Huh. And they would put like 50 guys inside this box and they would work all day shoveling the, the mud out and it would continue to just sink this giant chamber further and further into the mud. And then they, at the end of the day, it would, first of all, it would be super hot in there because was, the pressure was so high. <laughs> They'd be in there to like pressure covered cooker. in mud and thermodynamics is such that we increase the pressure, we increase the temperature. Yeah. And then they would come up the stairwell and then half of them would get the bends like crazy and some of them would die and they were getting paid a lot of money at the time, like two do- two and a half dollars an hour, which is a crap ton of money in the 1800s, but they were also dying like crazy. And they were trying, and they would they would do this until it got down and it hit the bedrock. And then they would fill the whole container up with concrete yeah. and then build the bridge on top of it. That's oh how they did God. every one of the footings for the Brooklyn Are Bridge. Are you serious? And just went through men, just killing men constantly, just uh, like everything that was built. It's <laughs> crazy. Let's just see how many guys we can kill in the process of making this thing. Um, but in the process, they were like, what is happening? How they go down there and then they come up and some of them die. <laughs> this is the 1800s. Well, they we're didn't not gonna know. stop, so we might as well learn. And then they figured out, oh, decompression. And so everything that we know about like the tables, the decompression tables for scuba, and like I've been at this depth, and now I gotta go to this depth, and I gotta stay at this depth for this long so the nitrogen gets out of my blood. And that was all from those guys, but also then, there, so then they could put people in the submarines. Because what they were doing initially in like the wars is they would put dudes in the submarines, they would send them down. And they didn't know, they, they all died over and over again, just like whole submarines of dudes just died God. until they figured, oh, we, now we know what's happening. It's a fascinating book. I'm just like four chapters in, but. What's it called? Chamber Divers. Chamber Divers. So Hal's telling us all, these, my all of these stories as we're about to go underwater. <laughs> I was like, but we're Did just, he hand you a shovel? But it was like, we're not, we're just free diving. We're not going that deep and we don't have to worry about decompression. Okay, well, I don't know. I do feel, I feel a little more, qu- I'm acquainted with it. I think you would I be fine like at it. I, I have to overcome something. I have more to overcome, but mm, I'm okay with it. I'm also okay with all the equipment. I kind of like the equipment. Well, let me tell you, those fins, you wouldn't want them for scuba, I guess, because they're just too long. You feel like Michael Phelps, man. Like, it's crazy how fast you can go. The fins are like this long. The fins are so long that what? they didn't fit in my bag. The fins that's are this long. It's a four and a half foot long fin. It probably is almost four feet, yeah. And, um, Damn. so, like, when you're, when I was at that plaque, I was like, okay, I'm kind of panicking. And I was just like, boop, 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 boop. I'm at the top that fast. You come up so fast. Okay. All right, well, I've given my rec. I might read it. Uh, I'm just listening to it, let's be honest. I'm just listening to it. All right. Well, thanks thanks for sharing that. I'm glad you survived. When are we going scuba diving, man? God. All right, we'll talk at you next week. Leave us a voicemail. We're listening to your voicemails, and we're looking for the ones that spark a response from us. Yeah, come on, y'all. 1-888. EarPod1. Use hashtag Ear Biscuits. Let us know what you think. Bye bye. Hey, y'all. I just listened to the episode about uh, what would happen to Good Mythical Morning if one of you suddenly met and unfortunately met your demise. I would really love to explore the option of like a pre made GMM video or a pre made Ear Biscuit saying, like, Hey, it's Rhett. You're watching this because I'm dead or whatever. I just think that would be a really cool way to to acknowledge it for everybody and go out. But hopefully that doesn't happen for a very, very long time. All right. Thanks.